Hey y'all, this is Liberated Love Notes, a podcast on Living Corporate Network hosted by yours truly, Brittany Janae, creator of Liberated Love Notes, critical self-reflections, and affirmations for the culture. You already know Liberated Love Notes is your source for weekly doses of self-reflection, affirmation, and reimagining for us by us. Y'all, this week, I want to talk about, focus this episode on the power in remembering. The power in remembering. And this was actually prompted by a number of conversations I've had with some friends and colleagues. More recently, a conversation I had with my father, which I'll reference a little bit later. And was further affirmed by this this documentary I recently watched in our mother's garden. If y'all have not checked it out already, please do. It is a documentary on Netflix. Word to the director, Chantrell P. Lewis, a black woman um, who I recently learned is also an alum of the Mecca Howard University, which made it all the more special. In Our Mother's Garden is a culmination of Black women. Black women recounting memories of their mothers, their their grandmamas, y'all, their great-grandmamas, and just sharing so pointedly and, and, and beautifully how their memories, their maternal lineage has shaped their experiences and understanding of Black womanhood. When I tell y'all, it was so nourishing, so nourishing. So beautiful, so nuanced, and at least in my experience, we don't we don't come across I don't come across that many art forms that I think really honor the complexity that is black womanness. And so this hit, like you had stories um, of grandmamas, Tarana Burke, if y'all are uh, unfamiliar, known as the founder of the Me Too movement, black woman. Tarana Burke shares a story of her grandmama who literally y'all walked up to a, a store, slammed the store or smashed the store's window with a pipe because she learned that someone in that store has smacked her granddaughter, right? So 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 grandmama wasn't 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 taking that. Um, so you had stories of those grandmamas to, you know, stories about the grandmamas who gardened and 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 made cookies. So nuanced. There was a uh, black woman elder, a jewelry maker, who was probably one of my favorite narratives, y'all. She shared about her passion for creating jewelry, and, and she referred to them not as accessories, but necessaries, and was really reflective about how black culture and African values, she reflected on how uh, those were core to the jewelry and pieces that she put together, black spirituality. Uh, she talked about her own lineage as a jewelry maker coming from the, you know, a family of, of blacksmiths, right? And how part of her being a jewelry maker, you know, was also knowing that that was in her body. That was in her remembering, you know, coming from folks who work with their hands and all the things. Anyway, she shares this um, explanation. She shares this explanation of of one symbol that uh, I thought was was a bomb explanation. And she uses it, the explanation of this symbol, to talk about the power in being rooted, rooted and how inherent it is to us. Our blackness. I actually want to play that clip, y'all, because I found it to be, well, one, I was tickled by it. And you might understand why in a bit. But I also think it gets at what I want to talk about today. Remembering, being rooted, and all the things. So I'm interested in y'all's take. It may look on the surface to be different symbols. They're all coming out of that upright human being. The Kananga, as above, so below. So this is black people's own star, David. And everybody got to take shit from white folk. If I could just say one thing in the whole world, don't nobody look for them to be an exemplar of anything but insanity. 
So if you want to be the master insane person on the world that loses regard for all humanity, join that group. So this is our people's stuff, upholding stuff, rooted to the earth. The roots of the tree are as deep and tall, should be as tall as the part that you see above the ground, to be rooted deep. So I think about the natural inclination to look externally for what we need. I think about the natural inclination to look externally for what we need. I think about what this elder shares about being rooted deep. I think about what that means as it relates to the richness of our culture being rooted. We don't have to look for anything external to us when we're rooted. I think about being rooted, rooted as we inherently are, and yet how little time we perhaps spend there, right? And by there, I mean tending to and remembering our roots, tending to and remembering our roots. And when I refer to roots and and remembering, I'm not talking about our roots necessarily in the context of oppressive systems, right? Our roots aren't just oppressive systems. I'm not necessarily talking about the intergenerational trauma that we oftentimes speak of. I'm not necessarily referring to the very valid pain that is passed down, the study of somatics. Somatics is the study of the ways in which our body holds on to, you know, trauma and pain, right? Recognizing that the body doesn't forget. And as much as those, you know, elements, pain, trauma are real, and as much as the body doesn't forget those things, I don't believe those things are primary, right? I don't believe those things are primary. And that I think when we talk about our roots, it means remembering. It means remembering that in as much as the body may not forget pain and trauma, it also remembers the joy, the love, the richness of our culture, the resilience, all of which are accessible to us as resources, right? I want to repeat and affirm that, right? That in as much as the body may not forget our pain and trauma, it also remembers the joy, the love, the richness, the resilience, all of which are accessible to us as resource, right? There are absolutely spaces that we exist in today that would have us forget, right? We exist in spaces that would have us forget the richness, the joy, the love. But we remember. Our bodies remember even when our minds may not, right? Our bodies remember even when our minds may not. That's why I think we get vibes and inklings and like intuition, the Holy Spirit, whatever else you want to call it. There's actually some science around, well, not even science, some some study around the ways of knowing, specifically in Black and African cultures, that a lot of it is intuitive, right? What we feel, particularly in community with others. I'll give you an example. Uh, Recently, my father He asked me out of curiosity if I recounted in my early childhood. um, So he was in his early 20s. So I had to have been about, you know, six, six or seven. He went through a phase where, y'all, he was studying the teachings of the nation of Islam. Y'all, you know, listening to the teachings of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. Our basement had pictures plastered of Malcolm X. Anyway, he asked if I remembered, and this was on the heels of me, you know, really beginning my path with Liberated Love Notes. He he asked if I remembered that in those moments or those Saturdays where he was, you know, downstairs listening or watching, you know, his pro-black musings, 
that I'd come wherever he was and just sit there. I sit next to him and listen. Uh, He referenced a few times where I'd even have a notepad and appear to be taking notes. And he'd be thinking like, what is she doing? (laughs) What is she writing? And I'm going to be honest, y'all. I have no mental recollection of this, right? I don't remember it. And yet, meaning like my mind, right? In my mind, I don't remember it. I'm certain, though, that my body does, right? I feel in my work that curiosity, that affinity for blackness and our culture show up in how I show up. And so I thought that was a really practical example of even when we might forget, our body remembers. And that's resource, right? That remembering, that knowing it is there It's resource. The body remembers joy, the kind of joy that surpasses the world's and whiteness's standard of value and wealth. I think about my grandmother, who may not have had a lot of money, but that never occurred to me because (laughs) Sunday dinners after church and the sleepovers with our cousins and frozen cups on the porch of 512 Rose Hill Terrace felt like enough. And so I got to remind myself of all of that sometimes. Resource, right? That sense of enoughness is resource, particularly in this culture of uh, domination, as bell hooks would describe, that would suggest no matter how far we make it, we'll never be enough. What we get or what we earn will never be enough. And so we must remember and use our rememberings as resource. Y'all, I've been, I've been reflecting on the fact that I come from a lineage of caregivers and caretakers, you know, where caretaking and open up one's home to others wasn't limited to those of whom came from your womb. I come from a lineage of nursing assistants and home aides and homemakers. Now, some of the the gifts of domestication, if I'm being honest, miss me. But I don't take lightly the inherited gift of creating spaces, creating spaces where folks can just be, where those I love and care for can commune in the fullness of who they are, feel safe and cared for, right? That's just in me. It may show up different, but it's in me and the body remembers. I must remember, I remember y'all, the fierceness of my mama. She was real clear, like, it's all love, fam. And my child not to be left around with just anybody just because we family. Talk about boundaries before there were like, you know, we was naming boundaries, right? I um, think about the boldness of my father when he went up to school that time. I told him that my teacher said that I was American, not African-American. I went home and told my father. The teacher was black, y'all. And so I chuckle about that because I'm like, wow, he was challenging internalized oppression before I think we even had the language. All of that is resource. Maybe remembering for you ain't those people or memories from, you know, like your direct elders or parents or ancestors, right? I know family can be complicated, but I think about there being just as much power and richness in remembering just like the Black diaspora. A few months back, I sat in on this community lab It was a community talk hosted by a a bomb organization out of Baltimore called Collectively. And the lab featured an elder, Mrs. Joanne Martin. She and her husband, her late husband, wrote a book on the historical roots of the self-help or like the helping tradition among African-Americans, y'all. 
and how it derived from customs and practices from the continent of Africa and how those customs and practices evolved through enslavement into um, Reconstruction and how our commitment to the collective is so, so, so. Like I walked away from that teaching, understanding how our commitment to the collective is so deeply inherent. Like y'all, they they broke down, she broke down like understanding mutual aid and like how the black church created like the, the penny saving clubs and like use funds to take care of those around us and like banks and insurance for our communities originated with the church because we took care of each other. All of it's so inherent to who we are. We must remember, right? We must, we must remember. Those before us certainly, right, are far from perfect. And I think that it's the, it's the, it's the lie of white supremacy that even, or would even have us suggest that perfectionism is the goal, right? course they're not perfect perfectionism ain't even the goal you know sometimes we have these expectations that those we honor or revere should be perfect or beyond reproach but that's not how humanity and living and learning and evolving and and emerging is set up and so we must disrupt the inclination to see people our people as merely good or bad, any more than they are human, nuanced, messy, figuring shit out. The best of us, the best of our mamas, the best of our daddies, the best of our grandmamas, the best of our granddads, the best of our aunties, the best of those before us, our resource, we must remember. We are more than, and I just want to affirm this, we are more than our trauma. We are more than our pain. We are more than our fatigue. Y'all, we are joy. We are love. We are community. We are learning and growing. We are thriving and surviving. Because there's something righteous about that too, right? I've been thinking about, uh, now remembering, remembering ain't got to be that far behind us, right? Remembering doesn't have to be that far behind us. I think about my paternal grandmother, y'all. Till this day, 76, she don't mind calling out white folks on their stuff. And I think I went through a, a portion of my early adulthood and maybe teenage years when I was like, ah, oh, grandma, chill, <laughs> doing the most. And I'm learning that that's resource. That sent me that boldness. I think about my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, one of the most faithful men I know. I used to think he was dealt the most unfair deck of cards in some situations. And yet, one would never know. That's resource. And so I, I just offer as a um, point of reflection, right? What are some of the lies? We have internalized about where we are from. How might those narratives no longer serve us? What narratives have we internalized that create distance between us and the beauty of blackness in all its forms? And what do we lose when we try to devalue more than we honor the gifts of our elders, our ancestors? I think about the lie that would suggest we need to move away from blackness, y'all. The lie that would suggest we need to distance ourselves from blackness to progress, to be better, to move up. And nah, (laughs) that is absolutely not our truth. I think about how most of the spaces we occupy, whether it would be corporate America or any other predominantly white, dominated uh, space, would have us forget would actually have us forget our roots, who we are, the richness. I think assimilation, code switching, existing on autopilot as we find our lane in some of these spaces can legit have us 
forgetting ourselves. And yet, the body will always remember. There is so much power in remembering. Even as we strive to rise and progress and smash ceilings and climb ladders, particularly in those spaces that were not created with us in mind, we must remember. Even as we strive to break generational curses, sure, that's good work. We must also ask ourselves, how can we give equal attention to those generational legacies that should be preserved and honored, right? Even as we strive to break generational curses, we must ask ourselves, how can we give equal attention to those generational legacies that can be preserved and honored? Y'all, even as we strive to heal from generational trauma, we must ask ourselves, What are those sources of generational joy that we can remember and evolve? Our remembering is resource. (laughs) Y'all, we are more than our oppression. I just want to say it again. We are more than our pain. We are more than our trauma and fatigue. We are joy. We are love. We are community. I want to end with this poem by, um, if you've been following me, you might already be hip or can guess, but this is another poem by Lucille Clifton. It's entitled, Why Some People Be Mad at Me Sometimes. And she shares here, they ask me to remember, but they want me to remember their memories. And I keep on remembering mine. (laughs) Mm, I keep on remembering mine. This week, y'all, this week and beyond, remember. Peace, y'all.